Good morning to uh, everyone in uh, Tamil Nadu. Um, I'm uh, really uh, honored to be uh, in, uh, asked to speak to you from uh, my own office here in the U.S. And MIGS is a, a big topic for American cataract surgeons uh, because the op we, we have so many glaucoma patients and really now we have an opportunity to uh, do something uh, beneficial with a high safety uh, track record. And that's why this is uh, such an appeal. And I understand uh, that you have different speakers and, and different topics. And so I've uh, really focused on some of the MIGS devices that um, are really the most popular now in the US. I do consult for Ivantis. I have no financial interest in Glaucos. Well, when I talk to cataract surgeons, this was a kind of a big change for many cataract surgeons uh, because in the US, you know, the tendency is when a patient needs glaucoma surgery, frequently the uh, cataract surgeon or the comprehensive ophthalmologist will refer to a glaucoma subspecialist. And uh, we sort of stayed out of the way. <clears throat> There's of course the David Letterman show was very popular in the US and they'd always have a top 10 list uh, every night. And so I kind of put together top 10 reasons for uh, FACO surgeons to get involved with MIGS, which is really microinvasive glaucoma surgery. And there are many different types. So for our purposes, I'm talking about doing this through the clear corneal FACO incision, something that's minimally traumatic to the target tissue. It's compatible with the rapid recovery, which is what our cataract patients already expect. Uh, certainly a good safety profile because as primarily a cataract surgeon uh, we are not well equipped or comfortable handling uh, filtering bleb complications. And so finally, efficacious, because if we're going to go to the trouble, we want to make sure uh, that it works. Um, so the, the number one reason is that there's an increasing number of both cataract and glaucoma patients. Uh, the bottom chart just shows the increase in cataract growth rate. And of course, uh, as that rises, so will the number of people that have both conditions. And this is just one estimate that as many as, you know, 22% of cataract patients uh, presenting in the United States are at least on one uh, medication, uh, uh, you know, from that. I don't know if this, let me see if I can move this out of the way and see if that, I hope that's not on the screen. Um, so if you look at the number of glaucoma operations in the US, uh, this is the projected increase based on what's going on. And filtering surgery, which is in the light yellow, is kind of the same. The growth has really all been from these MIGS devices uh, uh, that are implanted at the time of cataract surgery. So I think the second really most important reason uh, for us to do this is that anything we can surgically do to lower IOP has advantages over drugs. Uh, so from the patient standpoint, there's cost and inconvenience and side effects. And remember, they're both systemic as well as the ocular surface from things such as just preservatives, even if you're not allergic to the drug. Uh, in the elderly population, that means less reliance on others to help you uh, with the drops. Um, but uh, another important thing to consider is that with any pharmacologic treatment, there's a peak and a trough in the drug level. Uh, that's why the frequency is determined to try to maintain a certain level. But with a surgical device, it's just the same uh, really at all times. You don't have these uh, variations. Uh, this is obvious to all of us that uh, we really have no idea how well patients the different benefits of um, uh, lowering IOP and reducing patient compliance. Uh, so as I think everyone knows, there are many studies uh, that confirm what we worry about, which is that uh, patients have trouble with compliance. And I was basically saying that uh, one drop once a day, a prostaglandin analog is easy, but there are studies that show once you do a second medication or you start doing BID or TID or more, then compliance uh, drops. Um, so I think MIGS appeal to us as cataract surgeons because this is really a low risk uh, glaucoma procedure. Uh, there's really not a lot that can go wrong uh, with this. Uh, the eye stent, which we call now the eye stent generation one or the classic, which I'm doing here, uh, was really the first one 
FDA approved in the United States. So uh, compared to filtering surgery, it's really impossible to get hypotony. We don't have blood complications. There's really no added risk uh, to the cataract procedure itself. Uh, and so, you know, it really is important because uh, uh, we don't want to uh, generate other problems in a patient who's primarily coming in for cataract surgery. Um, this also doesn't complicate any later filtering surgery that has to be done because it spares the conjunctiva. And I think that this is also important because uh, in a patient who has advanced glaucoma, that first trabeculectomy is so uh, important. With um, the eye stent, uh, this is really uh, the first uh, trial. And, and this is really, I think, uh, a, a legitimate goal for many cataract patients is just to reduce the number of glaucoma medications that they need. Uh, this was the actual pivotal trial of eye stent plus FACO versus FACO alone. And this is really the trial upon which the FDA approval uh, was given. And this just shows that uh, the a number of people that got off of medications at one year and had a pressure uh, at or below 21, it was <clears throat> quite significantly higher with the eye stent. If you look at the mean number of medicines and what the decrease was, FACO alone, which we know will benefit many glaucoma patients, an, a mean of one uh, less drug with the eye stent, it was one and a half, which means you had more people with the eye stent getting off of two medications, just as many got off of two medications as got off of uh, one. Um, the fact that it may reduce the number of medications, uh, we shouldn't uh, underestimate the benefit to the patient and their lifestyle. Uh, you know, and I, I think, you know, when we do cataract surgery, uh, it used to be just focused on the medical part. And then we realized, my gosh, we can treat astigmatism at the same time. We can, if the patient wants, provide a refractive uh, benefit. Well, this is another lifestyle benefit. Uh, the IOP may be the same, but if we can allow that patient to get off of uh, one or even more uh, glaucoma medications, reducing the inconvenience and the side effects, uh, then that would be, again, a lifestyle enhancement. Um, the other thing that we like as cataract surgeons is, you know, it's already so... Uh, we spend so much time talking about refractive outcomes now and the different IOLs. Uh, so we, uh, you know, don't want to overwhelm uh, ourselves or our patients with a lot more discussion. But it doesn't take much to describe uh, a MIGS procedure because they have glaucoma. Uh, it's therefore understandable. And the main thing is there's no risk that we really have to discuss. And at least in the United States, these devices that we're talking about are uh, financially covered, and that has a big impact on, the, on their popularity uh, naturally. Um, another uh, advantage of MIGS for the cataract surgeon is that it's very efficient. It really doesn't add a lot of time because we're basically using the FACO incision. Here again is uh, an eye stent, and this is, you know, unedited, and you do obviously have to learn the gonioscopy skills. That's really the skill because the, uh, you know, the use of the small incision we're quite used to that already. Positioning the head is very important, but I think everything that we do with MIGS is within the skill set of a good fake go surgeon. And we don't have to do this in a different order. Uh, here I'm usually doing this after the IOL uh, is in place. The gonio lens is important. Uh, I like the Vold uh, gonio lens, and, and that's one that uh, uh, I use. Uh, but the uh, Basic uh, post-op care is the same. It's the same medicines. It doesn't impact patient comfort. And it really has no effect on the refractive or visual outcome. Uh, and that's important, again, for our cataract patients who have expectations uh, based purely on the cataract surgery. We mentioned that uh, this is important in the US and there's actually codes for this and it is reimbursed. Uh, and so, of course, this is uh, not this is certainly not the case around the world, and that's why some of the devices we're using, it's going to take a while before they're able to enter a different markets. But currently in the U.S., the, pay, the surgeon gets a very small extra payment, and the ASC gets the payment that covers the cost of the device. The, the last uh, item is really the fact that we now are getting more and more different devices in the pipeline. Excuse me. Uh, this is the iStent Supra. 
It's a super, super choroidal stent, uh, also from Glaucos. This is one, I mean, this is actually in 2011, um, eight years ago when I was uh, implanting it uh, there. And um, the Cypass, which was purchased by Alcon, uh, is the one that did actually get FDA approval. Um, and you can see that this is really going uh, in the suprachoroidal space. So it's using an alternative outflow to the uh, Schlem's canal system. And it's uh, basically shunting directly into the uh, uveal scleral flow uh, pathway. And uh, this device <coughs> is actually rather uh, easy to implant. Uh, it has unfortunately been um, withdrawn by Alcon <laughs> and uh, I will just show another case of, uh, that I, of myself doing this. Um, and the reason is that the FDA looked at um, cell counts and safety data for two years. This, by the way, is the guide wire. This is the hand piece. And uh, we had, uh, we used this for uh, about a year and a half and it really worked uh, quite well. And in, in our hands, we felt was very safe, <coughs> certainly safer than a bleb. Um, here you dock it into the holder, you extend the guide wire, and then when you pull it out, the stent is on there. There's a little guide wire. You go through the clear corneal incision and you'll see that um, you don't need to be I have the best uh, visibility of the landmarks. You basically find the iris root and you <coughs> pass this uh, through there. And then you'll see at the end, I tap this down so that only the last uh, ring on the tip is exposed. And what was found in, in the post market studies was that after two years looking out toward three and four, there was some greater cell loss. It seemed to be in the people that had too much of this stent exposed, which would kind of make sense. And uh, that is the concern uh, by which Alcon decided to stop uh, selling this for the time being and uh, until further notice. So. We now no longer have this available in the US. I think the problem is that you're again comparing it to FACO only, whereas if you compared it to um, uh, uh, any tube shunts or other filtering devices, uh, then we probably would have more tolerance for a little bit of cell loss. So uh, this was sort of my summary of uh, my list of um, devices, I'm sorry, of uh, advantages with the devices. So I wanted to then uh, shift to the two that we're currently using now in the United States. And the first is the iStent Inject. It became FDA approved in 2018. And uh, this is actually implanted differently. And you get two stents that are in the same injector. And there's a little button that uh, ejects the spring that uh, almost like a, a, um, a, a nail gun or a staple gun, um, injects it right into the meshwork. So here I'm holding it right up against the uh, junction of the pigmented and non-pigmented uh, meshwork. And I press the button and there's an ejection mechanism that implants this uh, so that the, uh, it, there, and there you see it right there. And it's going directly into Schlem's canal and bypassing uh, the meshwork. Uh, now, the same handpiece, you know, holds on to another uh, eye stent inject. So what I do is I sort of reposition the microscope and the gonio lens so that I can put it at some distance from the first one. And so this is a system that allows us to uh, put in two devices. You could put in two of the original eye stents, but you end up paying twice for that, whereas the, here the same fee uh, allows us two implants instead of one. Uh, and so since the actual retail fee is high, uh, this is why um, no one really puts in two eye stents in the United States nowadays, it's just too expensive. So uh, there is the eye stent there. There is a learning curve to this, but uh, once you've learned one MIGS procedure and you have the basics and the fundamentals of gonioscopy down uh, that it works rather well. The second stent that was approved in 2018 was the 
um, hydrus from Ivantis. Now look how long this is, it's eight millimeters. So it stents 25% of the uh, Schlem's canal. And this is the injector uh, that we have. So here I'm sort of exposing it. And then I go through a different paracentesis. I'm not using my incision. And there's the meshwork. Now what I have here is like a, um, a fairly somewhat sharpened um, injector and I'm aiming upward. And then when I've incised through the meshwork into Schlem's, then I advance the little knob and this feeds in this eight millimeter long stent. And then I disengage and then I'm just gonna kind of tap it in a little bit further there you see there. Uh, and so this now is entirely within Schlem's canal. Um, and it, uh, you have really nothing protruding toward the cornea. Uh, it's really uh, parallel uh, to the iris. Uh, and it has a dual mechanism of bypassing the meshwork through the opening, but also stenting it, literally holding Schlem's canal open. Uh, and there are these little windows um, in the device uh, that um, uh, allow aqueous to pass through. And so that's showing uh, the hydrus. Um, I'll go back a slide, see if I can go back. So uh, here you can see the little windows uh, that once this is in Schlem's canal allows the aqueous to uh, percolate through there. And here's the little knob that I use to uh, advance it. Just show one more uh, case here, obviously pseudo exfoliation. And uh, this is what I uh, am currently using, especially in, in those patients with uh, moderate glaucoma where I really wanna get the pressure as low as possible. Uh, so high, um, high zoom, I incise the meshwork right here. I aim up a little bit, slightly up at an angle. And then I, with the knob, advance the stent and um, you then see it moving superficially along. There's no resistance when you're in the proper plane. And so again, a learning curve to this, it looks like it would be difficult to insert, but it's all about finding the landmark and just uh, incising through the meshwork uh, at, at the right angle. And there you can see the, uh, the hydra stent um, in place. And then here I'm just sort of tilting the eye and uh, this is a heavily pigmented angle. So it's a little tougher uh, to see the stent, uh, but um, I can tell it's, uh, you wanna be able to see the glistening of the metal, the titanium uh, through um, the, uh, the meshwork itself to know you're in the right plane. And then at the end here, you see the stent at the top of the picture uh, right over here uh, and uh, that's the uh, end of the case. Uh, so I wanna do, just share one important study. This is called the COMPARE trial. And what it is is a randomized uh, comparison of hydrus versus two eye stents uh, and uh, randomizing uh, the patients uh, into this group. So uh, this is really a, a study because of the fact that we have so many of the devices now um, you know, wanting to say, well, which one is better? Uh, and so this study was done without FACO uh, and not using the inject, but two of the original eye stents. Remember I said in the US, we're really only implanting one because of the cost. So both of these have an inlet that bypasses the meshwork, but you see the lumen for the hydrus on the left is so much larger than that for the uh, generation one eye stent on the right. But remember, there's a second benefit or mechanism for the hydrus, and that is to hold the uh, canal uh, open and to stent it. Um, so it's sort of a dual mechanism. This cross section in some uh, cadaver eyes is showing a Schlem's canal. And then on the uh, lower left, how the hydrus device is actually dilating it and keeping it open. The eye stent anchors into the Schlem's canal, but it doesn't really work to stent it open. It's really more of an anchor. Uh, and so these are the two uh, different uh, mechanisms. 
And you know, one question is, of course, will these occlude over time? And as I showed, the hydrus has a much larger uh, opening. Kind of an interesting study, courtesy of Ray Brown. These are cadaverized. It's a pair from the same cadaver. And this is just showing outflow that hydrus has been implanted on the left and two of the first generation eye stents on the right. And then there's a way to inject dye under pressure and to see uh, the um, um, exit through the lymphatic system, uh, the episcleral uh, system there. And you can see how much more flow is going through the collector channels with the hydrus. Um, and then this is a benchtop uh, comparison done by uh, Carol uh, Torres's group. I'm gonna move this out of the way. And um, we uh, basically, again, it's a pair of cadaver eyes. This was done in 12. And uh, what happens is you compare in one cadaver eye the hydrus and then the other the two eye stents. And this is the outflow facility uh, without any device, which as you'd expect is the same since they're paired cadaver eyes. But when you put the hydrus device in, the outflow facility increases by 72% compared to only 34% with two of the first generation eye stents. So this was statistically significant and suggests that the uh, hydrus is a bigger uh, drainage tube and it does in fact should work better. Now, how would you go about comparing these things? You wanna make sure you're doing uh, you know, real glaucoma. So patients that are perhaps more than just one medicine, more than just ocular hypertension you wanna make sure they have an elevated IOP to begin with. In other words, not low tension glaucoma. So you do a washout and make sure they have an IOP. You would randomize the patients in the operating room, one to one with the uh, surgeon being masked. Uh, and you would do a standalone procedure. In other words, not just uh, doing, um, uh, you know, well, so that you don't have the confounding effect uh, of the FACO. You would uh, make sure you had experienced surgeons who uh, were not in their mi middle of their learning curve where you weren't even sure that the device got implanted correctly. And you'd want certainly long enough follow-up, preferably two years, so you could look at long-term outcomes. So this is the ideal trial, and this is in fact what the COMPARE study was. It's prospective and randomized, mild to moderate glaucoma on a minimum of two or more medications. The patient could be either phagic or pseudophagic because it wasn't combined with cataract surgery. Um, after washout, this was you know, ocular hypertensive glaucoma, high pressures, this was not low tension glaucoma. And then at surgery, they were randomized to either getting the hydrus or two of the first generation eye stents. But again, no phaco. And you can see the follow-up goes out to one and two years. It's an international uh, study with 12 centers including some in the US, but most uh, outside the US, and this lists the investigators. And I said it's important to know that they had experience. Um, so the ISEN, of course, has been out the longest, but uh, most everyone had good experience with the hydrus because again, it's unfair if the device never got implanted <clears throat> to try to uh, test efficacy. Um, if you look at the lens status, two out of three uh, were phacic. And so they were just getting the stent procedure and one out of three perhaps uh, was already had an IOL. No concomitant phaco. Uh, they really had real glaucoma. You can see from the field loss that this wasn't just mild ocular hypertension. Uh, the mean IOPs were the same. The diurnal IOP, uh, the washed out IOP was the same. And then the mean number of medicines, again, between, everyone had usually between two and three medications as you can see uh, there. Um, in terms of the outcomes, um, the devices were implanted successfully, uh, both of them. So that's important, reflecting the experience of the investigators. And uh, this is the follow-up. And you can see the follow-up was excellent in terms of most of the patients being seen out for the 24-month uh, follow-up. The 12-month results were actually, uh, have been accepted for publication in ophthalmology. They're actually available online now, but it hasn't come out quite yet in the print edition. And this was one year follow-up on this study. Uh, but what I'm gonna show you now uh, is not in that paper. This is the two year follow-up. Uh, and so you're gonna hear two year follow-up even though people going online to ophthalmology will just see the one year follow-up. 
Now, Hydrus is in blue and the two first generation ice stents are in yellow. If you look at the line across the top, that is showing on IOP on the left hand um, Y axis. It's pretty stable, uh, a little bit lower with the Hydrus, but it's pretty stable out for 12, 18 and 24 months. Um, and that makes sense because the um, investigators would keep adding medicines until they reached their target pressure. And if it still didn't reach that, then they, the patient might need surgery. So the benefit of the hydrus is seen in the lower bars where this is the number of medicines. And if you look at the y-axis on the right, it has one, two, and three medicine. So what you're seeing is that the hydrus was achieving that target pressure with fewer medications. And this continued uh, to be statistically significant out to 24 months. If you look at some of the subgroups at 24 months, again, hydrus in blue, the two first generation ice sense in yellow, uh, look at the people that were off medicine or who were on more than three medicines. So there was definitely statistically far more people with hydrus got completely off of their medications. Uh, in terms of people that, if you will, it wasn't working very well and so therefore they needed all of their medicines or more than uh, three or more medicines, far more people with the eye stent kind of got in this sort of failure group. Um, this is showing uh, the best uh, people. That means they were on no medicines. And on top of that, they got, remember everyone had to be on a minimum of two medicines. So that means they got off of their medicines that had at least a 20% drop in IOP. Uh, and it was uh, higher with the, um, the hydras. This is showing uh, safety outcomes. And the other quote failure would be the patient needing additional uh, filtration surgery. None of the hydras group, but 9.3% of the ISENT group needed more uh, surgery. So this was really um, showing that both of these devices are successful, they're safe. They both lowered medications compared to baseline but the hydrus was superior to the two eye stents in lowering the number of medications, the number of uh, eyes that got off of medications, uh, IOP mean reduction, and also avoiding uh, future surgery. And I think this again is because as we said here, the lumen is much larger and you get the stenting with the hydrus. Now what about the eye stent inject? I had mentioned that that is the newer uh, um, version of the eye stent in the United States. Well, it's much smaller in terms of its lumen than the original eye stent. And since we were implanting in the compare study two of the eye stents on the left, you would not expect two of the eye stent injects to do better. In fact, you'd probably expect them to do worse. And uh, this is again, this type of outflow study in paired cadaver eyes. Uh, and if you, uh, so without any inject, uh, any stents, it was the same. The original eye stents, two of them increased the outflow much more than two of the eye stent injects, and that was a statistically significant uh, difference. Uh, so uh, in summary uh, of all of these, it, it, it looks as though the size of the tube makes a difference, and the hydrus uh, was better in terms of uh, uh, all of these uh, parameters.